lot hello everyone i'm shreya this is sukanya and we are back again with another episode of intersectional feminism desi style season 3 brought to you by feminism in india so like we have discussed how gender reflects in various fields of work in the previous episodes of this podcast and uh, we all have different kinds of work environments in some workplaces we can afford to keep our persona our views and our opinions private but in other professions that is not an option and journalism is one such area of work where there's a lot of public gaze on the journalist especially with the advent of digital and multimedia journalism one often has to put their face their voices their opinions and their political views out there and they're all scrutinized they're correlated they're juxtaposed and many many kinds of consequences also ensue sometimes especially with women journalists we see that they become especially vulnerable to cyberbullying harassment and personal attack when they put their work out there our imagination of a woman in journalism is that of someone who's always ready on their toes chasing after news but how do we as a society make them feel deep within on a daily basis what do they feel every day when they're on field when they're working when they're putting their thoughts out there what is it like to be a woman in journalism in india today we will find out Uh, to talk about all of this and more we have with us a very very special guest i stress on the word very special because not only is she one of the most recognized and well known journalists in the country but at a very personal level she has played a huge role in shaping my outlook towards the field through the little interaction that i've had the pleasure of having with her while working with her very early in my career we're so delighted to welcome on our podcast the lovely mitali mukherjee Mitali is a news anchor, business journalist, writer and TEDx speaker and has covered and reported on a wide range of topics from political, global and local to economic. She's worked on CNBC TV 18, Doordarshan, The Wire, Mint, World Bank and The Indian Express. Mitali was also a writer and a young fellow and has been vocal about leading the conversations on financial equality for women and including them in conversations that impact their health, opportunities and lives. She's currently the director of the Reuters Institute's journalist program. Mitali, I'm so, so glad that you are here with us and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Thank you very much for the very warm words and you're absolutely right. Uh, I think with every sentence that gets added, I start feeling my age a little bit more. <laughs> But I'm very glad to be here and I'm really glad that we could make time for this chat. Thank you so much, Mitali. So I'll delve into the question quickly. Uh, you've been a journalist for now over a decade and you've covered business and economy for so long. What has that changed that you've seen over the years when it comes to, you know, people's natural reaction to seeing a woman covering this beat? Because, you know, there's that general idea that, you know, uh, the, the, the field of business, anything about money, anything about finances is a man's domain. So do you feel there's this, this there is... I don't I wouldn't say do you feel there is a sexist case but do you think that has changed how have your experience been So thank you for that question and I think it's quite a wide canvas for us to explore um I've been in the world of journalism for over 20 years now you know I I would sort of break that up into parts of whose perception looks like what so the first thing is you're absolutely right women tend to get identified with or blocked off into what is known as quote unquote softer beats you know cover health cover education that's the kind of thing women are often allocated having said that finance and business generally is not badly represented not in our country and not globally either but the question i think we need to ask is what does the pyramid look like how many women come in um, you know at the stage of reportage whether it is if you're talking about a television channel how many women come in as assistant producers how many women come in as reporters and where do they go from there you know at how much escalation or acceleration do we see in women's career trajectory versus what you see with a male journalist that's one part of the problem the other part of course is what's happening in the newsroom dynamics themselves are women being heard are women's voices being heard equally when they are making points about business uh, issues and the third part is the industry itself and i think that is to be honest perhaps the most messed up part of the equation um you're you're not just trying to prove yourself 
within your news organization you're trying to prove yourself in an industry that has had women but largely seems to be a boys club uh, and i say that with specific reference to the equity markets you know it's always sort of uh, of course you have an op- opinion but you're not there for your opinion you're there to like really look good and tell people what's happening with the stock market and why is your jacket this color and why is your hair tied up you know it there's so much focus on what you look like and so little on what you're saying that i think it's very dilutive for for women journalists especially the ones who are on air especially the ones who are speaking to the issue of business or equity markets or finance uh right mithai do you also think like uh, there is that there's this gaze that also comes with uh, like you mentioned that there are fields that women are uh, put into so when yeah. we uh, and uh, i think you you've worked in newsrooms for so long and in i have worked in newsroom for like 5 years now and i've seen that there's that thing uh, uh because i was interested in sports everybody was like but do you know what an offside is but do you yeah. like there's that thing like you're working in a newsroom you're doing this on a daily basis but on a daily basis you have to keep proving that oh no you know it you you're not just uh, defined by your uh, gender so ha- has there been instances as a journalist where your opinion has been dismissed on the basis of your gender and how have you navigated that yeah no absolutely i mean i think that's i think that's a recurring theme for women i completely hear you on the sports journalism i think it's as difficult because it's such a boys domain uh, you know maybe you could have an opinion on cricket because you're a woman from india but that's about it you know beyond that we don't really want to hear what what it is that you have to say i think that's what makes it more difficult uh, you know shreya the, the point that for women the start line is way back first i have to prove to you that i am more than consummant in my subject and then i have to get an opportunity for men you know the start point is far ahead it's that okay you're interested you're you know enthusiastic of course he must know about sports and of course we can give him you know a business beat and he can he can track that so you have to cover a far wider arc before you uh, even gain the confidence of those within your organization or speak with authority on a particular subject it's happened multiple times um you know being being cut off in conversations um doing interviews where the 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 guest or the interviewee would constantly answer questions only to my male colleague uh, and completely ignore the fact that I'm there uh, you know um uh, it's also as you uh, mentioned in your uh, in your introduction i think social media is such a complex beast and that's one place where it's very easy to sort of um really pile on to someone you may have a difference of opinion but when you ba- make it about gender and you try to bring it into saying oh here's a woman who knows nothing about this subject then you know it's quite clear you're not discussing the subject itself but you're questioning uh, the the gendered opinion that that's coming through so several times and i think social media is quite guilty of that um it's it's anonymous so it's quite easy uh it's also bears not too many repercussions i often say you know think about what you write or you tweet because would you say this in a room to that person looking them in the eye and if the answer is no then you should hold back on that um so carrying forward from what you just said um i want to ask you that you know while over the decades we now see greater representation of women in journalism uh, in newsroom hierarchies especially in mainstream media organizations etc there are women <clears throat> but the numbers are extremely skewed with the most top positions always being given to men uh, it's the same when it comes to panelists also when it comes to discussions on screen on tv channels etc so according to data by the gender representation in indian newsrooms 2021 report 85% of the panelists in all discussions are men what are your thoughts on this i mean what is is the way i mean we know that uh, this is a very uh, discriminatory lopsided statistic that we're looking at uh, what what do you think is a way to change this pattern you know so this is uh, it's such a layered subject <laughs> let me start with the manuals first you know one easy solution that everyone has jumped on to is that okay fine we've got four men so let's do this let's get a female moderator because then at least you've got a female form on stage she uh, you know so she can ask all the accurate and uh, adequate questions and you would have got you would have struck off that gender box i think what organizations need to consciously do is fight that uh, having you know 
not getting a manual is not equal to getting a female moderator. Sure, you must get her if she speaks well to the subject, but you have to think about women with expertise uh, who can lend a lot of credence to what is being discussed. That's one. And, you know, frankly, I would also say when you have conversations around gender issues or, you know, issues of how to, to, to mainstream gender, gender challenges, you must have a man as well on the panel. You know, I think it's really important because we get it, right? You and I and any woman who's been in this situation gets it. But it's important to also get men in and build allies, really. The second part with regards to hierarchy, I think is where the big problem is. And here, I think it's a problem of potential versus performance. For a woman to be considered worthy of a particular role, she has had to display outstanding performance to be then placed in that position. You know, you, you did 200% and so you can be bumped up to deputy editor. For a man, potential is enough. It's enough to say, oh, look at this guy. I think that if he's given the right opportunity, you know, he can go places. I think that bridge needs to be, uh, that gap needs to be bridged. You know, you have to bank on women based on their potential, not expecting each time that they would have done the whole circle, uh, you know, to be given that opportunity. That's one. The other very, very important thing, and I think this works, especially for newsrooms, is we're not thinking of, you know, the whole system has not been built on the arc of a woman's uh, a woman's life cycle, so to speak. Uh, there are realities of, uh, you know, uh, we, we come in at an early stage, we are willing to work hard, there is a point in time where perhaps we choose to settle down or other responsibilities come in. There are points in time where childcare comes in. Um, and we have to start, you know, splitting our time or at least we have far more domestic responsibilities and I don't think any organization has really restructured to think about that we're still working with the oh of course you have to come in at this time and of course you have to clock out at that time because that's how it worked for men uh, you know I at the start used to get into quite arguments with a lot of women who would say work from home is so great for women for women it's great for everyone everybody needs to take that load at home you know because work from home basically means a woman is doubling up she's somehow you know manically getting all her chores at home done and she's trying to be available and very professional at work you have to normalize the fact that child care or parenting or running a household is a two team job if you are you know if you do have a partner so you have to make those gaps and those spaces. And the last part to your question of, you know, how can we do this better? You know, stuff exists, but I think we have to stop thinking of it as just a checklist, as I was saying, for the manual versus uh, plus female moderator. You have to create audits and be very transparent about what you have done on a particular issue of diversity. And I'm not just talking about gender. One of the big problems in our newsrooms, as you know, Shreya, is the complete lack of representation, right? It's 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 the elite. It's uh, people from a particular socioeconomic background. It's people from a particular class and caste background. We are not listening to the voices that need to be heard. And we can't be talking to them. They have to be inside speaking with us. So I think uh, audits are a great way to go. Um, you know, and just consciously setting targets and then being transparent about what you achieved, you know, what is it that you want your newsroom to look like, a 50-50 mix in leadership, a 50-50 mix in representation, and how did you do, you know, year after year? Right. Uh, also, um, Mithali, like, taking from what you mentioned uh, about the lack of representation and not just about women and men there is a there is a huge lack of representation in terms of gender minorities and like you mentioned caste class background people from different caste and class and uh, I, I think i have another thing that i've noticed is that uh, a lot of times if there is a, a muslim journalist or a journalist from say somewhere like ladakh they are asked to cover say all stories on Ladakh where they might not want to cover Ladakh, the stories from Ladakh they want, might want to do something else so this stereotyping like you know you fit this bill because this is your this is your identity this is something that happens so much uh, in, in our newsroom so what are your thoughts on that like you know even when you have the representation it is sort of like you know uh, just for show or just for your uh, yeah. gains yeah, uh, you know, I think that's a two way process, to be honest, it's it's important as a young journalist to acquire experience across beats. If that happens to be somewhere, uh, you know, which which ties in with your your sort of cultural background, that's fine. 
I think sometimes also what happens is that uh, you speak well to the subject. You know, if you have some cultural context and you have historic context, you may well be much better poised to talk about it than someone else coming in. You know, it's like war reporting, Shriya. That's the problem, right? Or, or even reporting on strife, for example, if there is, uh, you know, unrest in Kashmir. You... And the moment that escalates, so it becomes a bigger story, you'll see you'll see the star of the show sort of parachute in, the parachute journalism, as we say, right? Why are we dissing somebody who stays in that area, covers it day after day, minute after minute, understands the beat, understands the people? So I think that priority has to be given. Do I understand the subject? Do I speak to it? Am I interested in it? And then you create space for them to report around it. And having said that, frankly, um, just look at what, we put out as news, you know, it's it's so biased to just one sort of very narrow worldview. Are we trying to put stories about, I don't know, anything at all, gender, minorities, uh, you know, socioeconomic distress? I don't even know if that makes it to the front page or certainly not to a news station anymore, which is a very, very sad reflection on the industry itself. Right. I, I completely agree because uh, and I think even the organizations or uh, smaller uh, media houses that are trying to uh, bridge the gap by talking about these issues, there's so much trolling, so much hate, so much like I, I see all the time, like on our comments on Instagram and or on, on, on our mails, we have these flurry of messages from these right, right, not just right wing trolls, but just men in general who just cannot to, like tolerate women talking about women's issues so uh like I completely hear I mean I completely it, it's sad and I feel like probably one of the worst times to be a journalist in the country I mean great and worse because worse because journalism is really dying but also somebody has to hold the fort I guess <laughs> Uh, it's a trial by fire, isn't it? I mean, it's not easy. Um, what can we say to hard sell this uh, this job or this industry? <laughs> yeah. Very little, except for the fact that, you know, you really have to be quite driven to be part of it. Uh, but as you said, I think there's also the opportunity to create so much change. You know, it's interesting. I'll give you a quick example before we move on, Shreya, which is that recently at Reuters, we did a, a lot of research around climate and how audiences are sort of, you know, consuming climate news overwhelmingly across the eight countries we looked at. And this was a mix of developed and, you know, lesser developed uh, nations. People turn to the news, people turn to, you know, their sources of whatever, newspapers, television, radio, to get information and to be updated around climate. There is still, they are turning to you. But the question is, what is it that you are giving them, you know? Um, I, I think that that's something we need to think about very carefully as, as people laugh and say, you know, if the television channels and the what and, and WhatsApp shuts down for a month, who knows, you know, what we how we emerge from the other side and what kind of sort of quality we are by the end of that process. I agree. I agree. Like it's so um, and it's, it's it's not even something like you can say, OK, this generation is what is consuming that news and this generation isn't I don't think it's a generation thing anymore it's just uh, people uh, attention span is really less and they will uh, and it's so easy to polarize because of social media it's just so easy for a wrong information to be considered right and be out there until someone points it out that hey that is wrong or that is not okay uh, so it's it's strange how technology while we can do this because of technology, but it has also not been the bestest of friends. You know, it hasn't, but I think um, I think it would also be sort of remiss of us to to kind of lay the blame on technology because even for something like gender, you know, Shreya, it's there. It, technology is kind of a mirror to our face, right? It's reflecting what remains as general opinion around women, around their role, around you know what they should be doing or not be doing you know very well right newsrooms are a little microcosm of that you know what are you going to do it depends on depends on how you look it depends on uh you know so many things for a woman and 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 perhaps lower down the line is really her her innate ability to do that ageism for example is such a re reality for women journalists where um, the moment you start crossing a certain age 
you are kind of pulled off from the the, the front of the screen and taken into more you know uh, backroom responsibilities that's one and then it's at the other end where you are often considered too young or oh, she's too young to talk to this topic and she's too young to handle this um so you're stuck right which is the sweet spot there <laughs> you're either too young or you're too old uh, and i don't think that men really have to face that no it's patronizing on both ends i think <laughs> mitali drawing from what you just spoke about about men and women having different yardsticks when it comes to what kind of who is heard what kind of justice is given and who is believed and who's given more opportunities etc um i feel that another important thing that must be discussed is addressing sexual harassment in media houses uh, the me too movement in the media is even more complex because of the public gaze that is involved so do you feel that we have come to a space where survivors feel safe yet to address sexual harassment at the workplace without fear of loss of employment or sidelining or you know not being believed etc how does it work in media houses uh, spaces that are so dynamic and uh, so visible all the time what do you feel about it i mean i really wish the answer was yes uh maybe the optimistic view is that at least we've started the journey look rules exist right we have posh guidelines we have the vishaka guidelines all of that is in place many large news organizations do have a sort of sexual harassment committee which looks into this but are we anywhere near uh, you know addressing this in a in a meaningful and honest manner i would say emphatically not uh as you said it is so layered now first of all there are there is sexual harassment which is completely overt and then there are references and nuances which are not you know as a woman journalist what are you supposed to do you know what do you call out you call out somebody's somebody's gaze or somebody's uh you know obtuse comments you know what they are saying they know what they are saying but it hasn't reached the point where you know you can you can raise a formal complaint about it this is again where i go back to the point about you know auditing it's really really important to be transparent about this and to you know be clear about what kind of action you're taking and this is a trust building phenomenon frankly you are going to lose really good talent if you are not transparent about this women do not want to work in an environment where they are constantly watching over their shoulder it is very very difficult for a young female journalist to stand up and say this person who's you know three times my boss's boss uh said this to me or you know this happened and i want something to be done about it um it would be much easier to hush it up and it would be much easier to sort of ease that person out of that role which tends to be you know what we do as a business journalist uh, I, it was you know one thing is traversing what's happening in the newsroom and one thing is traversing the outside you know when you start getting messages from people who have been guests on your show and are and are fairly respected uh, senior people in the profession um you have to constantly be drawing those borders for them that they should be drawing for themselves you know you have to play their moral compass and politely back step from what is clearly not an okay gesture or overture you know uh, so i think women uh, get quite sandwiched you have to deal with this kind of attention from the outside you have to deal with it inside um and there are there, there are multiple ways i think uh, honestly in which you know it it's very difficult i won't name the organization but there was a period in time when i was expecting my child and i was pulled off shows uh you know this is it's not okay and i'm what makes me optimistic is that in this day and age it may not be that easy to do it but it did happen you know and you knew that there was no other reason but that there was I don't know I guess some kind of uh, resentment that uh, this person is you know will not be available 6 months from now because she goes on maternity leave I don't know if it was about perception that you know she looks very pregnant and we can't have her on screen but uh, all these realities exist this is not sexual harassment but this is certainly mental mental turmoil for uh, a female journalist who really doesn't know what you know what what is going on here and how to navigate it like it's it makes me sick it makes me sad it makes me angry but like it's just like this flurry of emotions it, you just don't know where to channelize them well i think you know i mean just to interject i think you guys are channeling it in such a positive way uh you, you women need to hear from more women they need to hear about lived experiences to normalize this 
uh, women need to raise their voices as look communities matter and you know the fact that you guys are building a community is is really 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 the best way to do this if we all speak in one voice and the less we start seeing each other as competitors and more as allies within a newsroom the better it will be frankly that's also a reality right uh, at least many years back women were often undercutting other women purely because it was such a small piece of cheese and everyone's running for it if we try to realize and we try to support each other saying there's space for all of us to flourish and function i think that's you know that's the way to go and secondly you know because this has come up in conversations i just wanted to mention it a lot of men often say i really feel i i feel for this i don't know what to do um i'm not sure how to help and to them i would say be allies and be mentors i can't uh, you know emphasize the importance of male mentors enough to have someone who is far more senior helping supporting counseling uh, you know younger women journalists helping them build a beat for themselves helping helping them build connections navigating you know what is often very tricky terrain it's not easy to be a political journalist or a business journalist you have such a great role to play in that regard and also just as you said normalizing what is um, personal life development for many people you could get married you could have babies you could take time off let's just normalize it Mitali uh, talking about your current and more recent um, uh, outing as the director of journalistic programs at Reuters you must be engaging with a lot of younger journalistic minds from across the world i imagine uh, so what has it um, what has been uh, also i mean for for a person who looks at it who's who's been engaging with your work and your career from outside it it looks like a it looks like a very exciting mix of things that you're doing so what has been a big highlight for you with regards to that when you interact with them how does it feel thinking of the future of journalism you know from a global perspective do you feel that uh, it's uh, it's much more diverse it's much intersectional what do you feel interacting with so many young journalists from all across the world um so i'll speak first to you know my interest in the role and then i'll speak to you know my experiences so far and i don't mean this in a in a sort of cutesy fashion but you know often times newsrooms are extremely competitive spaces because journalists are by nature quite individualistic it is about your byline it is about your piece it's about you being you know on screen uh i I sometimes struggle with that because I you know I I enjoy working in teams uh, you know that's just the way it, it is some people don't enjoy it and that's perfectly fine I uh, I I I I completely support that and like I I give a plus one because I have worked with you so I I completely <laughs> like oh, I I, I yeah. little bit of business uh, that I know is thanks to you I wouldn't have known that thank I, you <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so i think that's what i really love about this role that it's an industry which i love and i deeply love journalism but it's the ability to be a collaborator you know help someone who is practicing journalism in very difficult circumstances connect someone to the other one to help them i think that's what i love about the role what my experience so far has been is that it's tough it is so tough but there are people who who remain so deeply committed to the idea and the practice of journalism that you know that's what gives me motivation every day frankly speaking when you when you boil it down a lot of what young journalists so journalists generally across the world are facing is the same thing threats to press freedom clamping down not enough support from an organization um not enough not enough infrastructural support you know in on how to practice journalism per se for the younger journalists especially the women social media is is it's a tricky one right you're doing a great job you've written a great story but you're not getting the likes and the hits you don't maybe want to be on twitter but you have to be on twitter once you're on twitter you have to have an opinion about everything you know uh, and and often times it's it's okay not to have an opinion you know you want to see different points of view you just want to know more about it but there is this pressure you know speak about this speak to that uh, highlight your story push your story did it get picked up by another big face and got retweeted um these are all realities for journalists across the world i don't think it, you know it's unique to any one country but i come back to the point of community 
I think touching down, speaking with fellow journalists, just sharing experiences in a non-competitive environment is so important and healthy for all of us. We have to, we have to open ourselves out to that and be vulnerable and say, you know, you're struggling and so am I, and that's okay. Uh, Mitali, as a closing question that I would like to ask you is, what is that one message or advice that you would like to give young and budding journalists who are coming in into this uh, field with and in not a very great time for journalism, especially in India. And so they, with a lot of insecurities, a lot of vulnerabilities are in store for them and uh, they're scared, they don't know what to do. So what is that one message? Uh, as a, a veteran journalist, I don't know, if, <laughs> but as someone who's <laughs> been in the field for so long, uh, what is that one message that you would give them? I think one or two things. Don't place too many expectations on yourself uh, right at the get-go. It, it is a long sort of ladder up. Uh, you got to keep climbing. Don't feel disillusioned if you start facing rejections or, uh, you know, you don't hit the milestones you wanted to. And trust me, you will, you will stumble many times. Many, 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 many times. Just say that to yourself. And just know that everyone else has also stumbled many, 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 many times. Uh, but you just got to get up and keep going. You know, I, I, I would just say in any industry, honestly, Shia, for women, just get up and keep going. You got this. Um, don't let anyone diminish your view of what you think you are capable of. Just keep at it. And the other thing I would say is just consciously seek seek to build a community for yourself whether it is senior journalists whether it is friends with whom you can just offload some of the pressure you face whether it is people uh, within the industry that you're interested in build a community for yourself there's no way anyone can do this alone the more people you have to guide you and help you and support you you know the better it is and 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 don't be afraid to ask for help i think that's the other thing you know women are just they are so conscious of the fact that they're going to be judged they often hesitate to ask, but uh, just go out there and, and say, I don't know this. I need help with this. Please support me with this. And, and that's perfectly fine. Having people like you in the field, it gives us a lot of uh, courage. It gives us a lot of uh, when, like hope. And it also gives you that sort of sense of solidarity that, you know, there are people who are out there willing to help, willing to uh, mentor you in, in ways uh, that will shape your career for the better. So thank you so much for being that. Uh, I think there's, you know, I'm I'm uh, sort of, I don't remember the, the, the Muhavra itself, but there's such a beautiful term in Hindi, which basically says, you know uh, use your veil and make a flag out of it you know go there and be fierce and and, and really wave your own flag uh, and I would say that to every young woman regardless of whichever industry they're getting into that brings us to the end of this episode um, this conversation has been insightful and it has been empowering and encouraging in so many different ways especially for me and Shriya as journalists to be able to listen to you Mithali with your rich experience years of experience in journalism of uh, telling stories putting together pieces and uh, also as someone who has seen all the biases and seen uh, the length and breadth of the ladder if I may say so and also someone who is now training young journalists it's it's been very very encouraging and very empowering to be able to um, listen and to your experiences and in, in you know from such a close quarter and to be interacting with you and um, we can only hope that uh, five years down the line uh, may we have another conversation maybe sooner but uh, when we have this conversation again um, a few years down the line uh, we can only hope that we're looking at better statistics we're looking at better inclusivity we're looking at uh, safer workspaces for women when it comes to journalistic organizations and that we're looking at news which has a lens of empathy and a lens of diversity and a lens of truth uh, that's all that's that's what all of us strive to do and it's been great talking to you thank you so much for taking time out for this podcast and to speak to us um, thank you thank you very much for all the work that you do thank you so much for having me my best wishes to your team for everything that lies ahead in 23 and just keep the flame burning that's all everyone we'll be back with yet another episode of intersectional feminism desi style season three stay tuned and stay safe Thank you.